pleasure to be here today uh, with Sandra and Janet and all of you, so thank you very much for coming out. Um, we are going to structure this quite loosely as a conversation um, and welcome uh, any insights or questions you might have as we go along, so um, feel free just to you know, uh, ask a question if you have it, and it's burning. Um, and um, I think basically what we're going to do today is stay focused on the work that's here, that's in front of us, that we can hopefully spend some more time with this afternoon. And um, I'm just going to start off briefly by uh, requesting uh, a little bit of background information uh, in terms of the, the title for the show, which is Sandra's title, I Feel Real, and um, how that relates to the work from both of your perspectives. And then uh, after that, we can, I think, go into, you know, if you guys want to talk a little bit about your process, uh, the processes you engage to uh, produce the work that's with us, uh, I think that might be a, a good place to start. So, Janet, would you like to? Do I feel real? Do you feel real? <laughs> Do I feel real enough to, to respond to this question? Um, I love the title, and it's Sandra's title, um, which she generous, generously allowed us to um, use to share for the, this exhibition. Um, we, we visited uh, in my studio, and um, when she, when she told me this was the title she was working with, I just fell in love, as I often do with Sandra's titles. She's, she's, she's often, I mean, she's really good with that. And the thing that I think appealed to me so much about it is that it presupposes that you don't feel real. <laughs> and um, I think that we, our work is very, very different, but um, we, and we come at perhaps a similar kind of content or, um, idea, but from very different directions, the goal of which I think is to feel real. Um, so I've always been an admirer of Sandra's work. I know this isn't to the point, but um, what I love about her work is that the, the, the clarity and the humor and the, the, the intelligence and... I know, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, um, okay, back to the title. I'll, I'll, let you, I'll let you say a few words. <laughs> Thank you so much, Janet. <laughs> That's so great. Um, I don't think I ever told you this, Diana, when we were doing the catalog information, but I Feel Real is, from a, is a line from a song called You Make Me Feel, in parentheses, Mighty Real, by a disco musician named Sylvester, uh, 1978. Sylvester was a cross-dresser. This song has been in my head for maybe two decades, and I listen to it frequently. Um, he passed away at a really young age from AIDS, but I believe he was uh, one of the best disco musicians ever. Anyway, um, I love the song because it portrays someone in the throes of ex sexual ecstasy looking at a partner feeling real to such a intense wonderment. I mean, it's so beautiful to me. And it's not about the sexual idea of it or anything. It's about that idea of, oh my God, I exist. And there's something about an enthrallment with painting where you have that moment of ecstasy and I can communicate with the charred lady and that makes me feel real. So um, that was kind of the broad idea behind the title and I didn't, I mean, I, it was a natural to me to see it for Janet's work as well. So that's the title thing. I think maybe one thing to add is that we're both creating fictional characters who are not based on real people. So the idea that in that process of painting that somehow there's an activation towards, um, like you said, like you, you feel they're alive, that they're real, um, 
and hopefully that the viewer looking at them also experiences that. Yeah, I think those ideas around, you know, reality and the imaginary that both of you play with in the work uh, and is such a long, uh, and such a big part of the long history of painting too is like, it's really pushed in that, that title, right? Um, so it, the, in a way for these paintings to kind of, uh, they also become real for, for the viewer as objects, but they, they're, they're about us becoming, like recognizing things about ourselves when we're looking at them, when we're, when we're thinking about them, deconstructing them. Mm -hmm. So um, can you talk a little bit about how the two bodies of work came together? Because as you said, they're very different uh, approaches. Um, but obviously, there's relationships in terms of um, you know, portraiture and the history of painting, these ideas of reality and the imaginary. But um, how did this happen between the two of you, besides a long-standing admiration, obviously, mutual admiration of the work? Well, we didn't work in close uh, collaboration or we didn't collaborate. We had a studio visit um, and we talked about scale, how, how large we were going to work. And we talked about um, dolls and um, figurines and we shared some of the influences that are behind our, our different uh, bodies of work. Um, and um, what was it going to say? That was pretty much it. That was pretty much it. And then we went, and then we went, we went to our respective studios and, yeah. and did the work. So, but Sandra told me, <laughs> we did, I don't know if you, we had an uh, email exchange or something. You told me you were thinking about Manet, yeah. who's one of your favorites. And I was like, really, Sandra, Manet? Really? <laughs> because he's one of my favorites too, oh. but I don't associate him with your work at all. So that was kind of interesting. And that got me thinking more about art historical references because you were using them actively. So my Gainsborough guy sort of seemed to fit also. Uh, Sandra, do you want to talk a little bit about how you produce the work that we're looking at today? Um, I was at a... a kind of frozen point in my studio situation, having just made a big transition, prepared the studio, like it took a year. Um, and I started playing around with, I have c collected um, countertop mannequins for many years. I have maybe 12, it's, you can call that a collection. And that led me to these little um, paper mache candy containers that used to be made for holidays for kids. Um, and I became enthralled with the ones made of vegetables. They would be mostly associated with Halloween. Um, the philosopher in the library room was the first one, and he's based on an actual one of those. So I proceeded to construct an actual figure with the uh, miniature pumpkin, uh, lemon, and the zucchini and the potatoes. So I made the little guy, uh, he was about that big, in my studio. They're just stuck together with toothpicks and things and a little armature to hold them up. And then I would prepare a full sheet of gessoed paper and try to paint him really quickly like so that I could just make him magically exist as a painting. So I knew my goal was to make a painting. So I wanted it to happen as fast as possible. So that maybe like took me two hours, um, and cut it. And then I cut it out, so he became a paper doll. And the magic of cutting out a paper doll, especially when you paint it yourself, is it is suddenly real. Like it suddenly can dance around and be posed with different stage sets. And I love Manet, so I would think of how would, you know, where would he be in Manet's world? And so that's the process involved. So all of, all of the figures are pasted on this cutout paper. Um, and then the scenes behind them are constructed afterwards to suit the figure. And Janet? <laughs> so um, my, what, 
work in the show is part of an ongoing, long-standing uh, practice of working with the female figure. And uh, they're based, they're drawn from fashion, uh, found images, which I, um, I spend a lot of time looking through um, magazines and, and trying to find some sort of motive or uh, starting point. I also use collage, uh, inter, uh, sort of splicing together different bodies with different heads, almost like an exquisite corpse. And you can see that in a couple of the paintings, the switch one and the um, Alberta one, where the head is belonging to a different <coughs> body than the body. Um, and trying to create some sort of shock, um, some kind of um, alteration or um, uh, some kind of motive, as I said. Um, and then my work proceeds through hesitations and refusals, and it, that's the starting point, but uh, there's a lot of change that happens in the course of the painting. The head can completely change. Um, the, in, in some cases, they're built from the back forward. In some cases, they're built, that is to say, so, for example, this little painting, the landscape, was an abstract painting that I worked on for a long time, and the figure came last. Or the still life, where the still life was built first, and the, again, the figure came last. But then in others, the figure comes first, and the landscape comes after. So there isn't one sort of rule that they follow. Um, and uh, let's see, what else can I tell you about that? Um, yeah, the change and the, and the sort of hesitation becomes part of the content, actually, um, which I think is visible in, in the work. And uh, yeah, I think I could go on, but. I'm interested in both of your approaches to the idea of the model um, and the collage. And like the model for me uh, is uh, an idea of something that's in formation. It's, n it's never complete. It's moving towards something that is, is ideal and, and points to uh, t types of construction. And so here, in both of your descriptions of your process, um, we can see that happening. But also, I'm interested in sort of conceptually how you relate to that idea of the model uh, uh, relative to, say, yes, figure painting, but also I think, you know, there's different ways that we can think of the idea of model in terms of social constructions. Mm -hmm. okay. um, I think of the model in that sense, Diana, as the toy that gets you to start playing. So when I built my little vegetable guy, it was basically a still life that I could put paint, but um, of course it was much more than that because it involved a playful um, interaction on my part, interactions involving gesture, cho choosing colors, um, you know, putting the form down on, on the paper, but through that, like say two hour play, um, that's when things were very, very intense for me personally. So, of course, nobody was there, but it was incredibly joyful and it was like, oh, lost time. I, it was like that was what you wish for. So, um, I mean, that's what I think of as model. And I suppose, I mean, I'm trying to think of other ways to use that word, but I don't know if that's what you were getting at, but. Um, it was uh, an activation of play, which is su such an important part of making art. Mm -hmm. um, so my source material, they are models, actually. Mm -hmm. um, and what's key about the models uh, that I'm using as references is that they have a certain generic quality that allows me to project what I want to. Mm -hmm onto them. They don't have the specificity of a real person. And that's quite important um, to allow me to engage in that, that play that pushes them and pulls them into a kind of 
a, a zone of being or, or, or a state, because I'm more interested in their state, their emotional condition mm -hmm. than the specifics of the person. So that's partly why they have a kind of generic quality. And there's always this kind of balancing point where it has to, it has to be able to function in a sense as, as a model that's incomplete, as you were saying, um, to, so that it can, it can be treated almost like plasticine mm -hmm. and, and moved around to see how it, e how it emotes or how it evokes an idea. So they're, they're not real people, right? Mm -hmm. They're ideas um, in that sense. And there, um, there's spaces for, for projection for, for us, you know, as viewers that are looking at these works. It's, it's you know, it, when I first saw your work, Sandra, I mean, I really didn't know what to do with it. And, um, and I kept looking at it and turning off my computer and then looking at it again. And, and you know, they're so, they're so absurd right in a way but they're also you know you're looking at um you know a construction a vegetable construction that is you know referring to fragonard right and uh, and you're seeing that and you recognize it immediately right um so for me what's interesting is that what they they reference these underlying sort of uh models of of knowing and recognition uh, and we see the real, the real thing. It's a real painting that was painted from life, from vegetables. Um, and uh, yet, what we're looking at isn't actually what we're seeing. What we're seeing is the model of something that is constructed, you know, before we encounter the work. And I think, in Janet, your, your work does the same thing in many ways. And it is that kind of, uh, you know, the circulation of these familiar images uh, in the work that are still somehow, they're really familiar, but they're unnameable. They're undefinable, right? Mm -hmm. And we talked a little bit last night about this notion of the un uncanny. And uh, Janet, you want to talk a little bit about how you see your work relating to the uncanny? No. No. <laughs> no, but um, I wanted to say some, I mean, because I'm not sure how I would enter that question. Okay. But um, one of the things I, I wanted to mention was about, about the idea of awkwardness, uh, which is, uh, I think, something that is in both Sandra's and my work and something that uh, is, key in a way, like you mentioned, the, the, the absurd quality of Sandra's work and the, the humor. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that the awkwardness that, I tr that I'm also trying to uh, make strange, making strange, maybe that relates yeah, to the idea strange. of the uncanny. Yeah. Um, so that they are familiar, the images I'm using, you, you can sort of see the references that they are models. But um, they're, they're not the way you usually find the models. They're, they're more awkward, they're more uncertain, they're more um, in, in process of formation. Mm -hmm. And uh, the painting process is, is part of how that manifests itself. Um, in Sandra's work, I think that's more direct. Like, it, it's, it's right there, it, immediate. Um, and uh, so, um, yeah, making strange, I think that when you confront Sandra's work, it's almost like, you know, what, what am I, what is this? Mm -hmm. um, and maybe that, that question happens more slowly in, when you look at my work. Um, when I look in a, into Janet's paintings, I feel like I'm looking through a veil or a, a sheet of glass with like a haze on it. And I think I know what I'm looking at, uh, yet I, it's, it's withheld from me somehow. It, it does seem, I mean, you say they don't, I, you, whether they're familiar or not, to me they're very, they're very familiar, and I feel like I know them in an instant, even though they're very absurd. Um, I, I'm, but I, the thing is about the uncanny, I want to, know that woman. 
I wish I could meet her, you know. So that's the thing about the beauty of painting is there's the tragedy of it that you can't you can't get in there. That's the veil I'm talking about that's that keeps pushing you out. But then they're so seductive that you want to jump right back in again. So you're in this constant back and forth, um, wanting to go in yet being dis disallowed from doing that. And I think with my work, um, I I. They seem so standard to me. Like I look at them and, oh yeah, it's like I know I know that lady. Like, <laughs> there's nothing weird about that. And, but then um, I can see, oh yeah, they are a bit weird. Like, why is that <laughs> paper stuck on there and everything? Like, so, I mean, I see what you're saying is they're sort of opposite of each other, but they have the same um, making you uncomfortable mm -hmm. about what it is you're seeing, but yet wanting wanting more of it somehow. Yeah, I, and I think empathy is important in both of our work right. too, and is one of the things that I look for in, when I'm making something. It's like I have to, I have to like the person I make, and I, I have to relate, be able to relate to them. And so when you say you want to, you want to get to know them, it's, that's, I think, I, I want, you to want to. <laughs> and with your work, I, I feel very empathic towards these characters. I always, that's something that's pretty consistent, that you get their inner, this inner stuff out there. So that, you know, and I, I, I feel for them. <laughs> mm -hmm. And I think that, yeah, for me, that's a, it's very difficult to um, a look at either of your works and think, Okay, well, that's the subject, and that's the object, and you know, like, and or even or even um, clarity around things like foreground and background, you know, uh, these ideas, uh, particularly in your work, Janet, are like sort of culture, you know, um, sort of nature culture. There's like you're constantly pushing and pulling. I I find the the viewer back and forth between these dichotomies so that it's not, you never feel sort of comfortable to name it or define it. Uh, and for me, that's like a, that's a really a strength of the works because then it, it, it constantly makes me reflect on my own um, uh, predetermined positions that I come to a painting with. Mm -hmm. You know, this is a, um, you know, you, you were both incredibly knowledgeable about the history of painting and, um, you know, the structures of, of visual culture and how those predetermined ideologies uh, are active in the work. So how do you, you know, how do you play with that? How are you uh, um, sort of consciously subverting that or, or in some cases magnifying it? Oh, that's a question. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think you sort of said it, like there's always this with and against, with and against, you know, within the tradition of still life or, or landscape, but not, you know, yes and no. So I'm always trying to, I'm not trying to, but there's an unsettling that is, you know, you're, you're sort of wrestling with the tradition and trying to trying to work within it but you know ex express a different perspective um, or there's something about the um, um, there's something about the genre or the form that is you know you want to push against mm -hmm. you know to just like wake up <laughs> and to to um, to manifest something more personal, I guess, that is unnameable. You talked about naming and unnaming. Yeah, yeah for me, it's always, uh, it's very unnameable. That's why it's hard to talk about, too. Yeah, I, I mean, I'm, I'm not really sure if I can answer your question, but my thought is that um, something about the manner in which the figures in my works are constructed, it just seems so vernacular. 
and um, easy, like almost anybody could do it. I mean, I have skill. I know a lot about color, but I, I didn't spend a lot of time. You know, they're not overly illusionistic or trying to be representational. They're, they're basically vernacular home paintings that you, anybody could do. So um, to me, that's uh, a, I don't know, I don't want to say critique, but it's, it's an unusual step to take in a, in a gallery. And, um, but then also to have Manet as a reference, or Fragonard, or Courbet, which is, some of them do. I mean, yeah, well, you can try to copy a Manet, but good luck, you know? I mean, so it basically, yeah, it's all twisty and um, I don't know. I can't think of anything else to say. <laughs> When you talk about it being based in a, a vernacular, I mean, it's like, again, we can go back to this sort of I feel real notion, right? That um, this is like the, um, you know, I think I refer to your <clears throat> process in my text is like, you know, pulling from like hobby craft, yeah. you know? Um, pulling from kind of those traditions and, you know, and then of course, overlaying that with references to, you know, modern masters like Manet, uh, you know, the beginning of realism, right? Um, but it's like, so really these are absolutely what you get, um, but they function as decoys in another way to point into another history of realism, right? And yeah, I guess the question there is like, we go back to that key question of, you know, what is reality? And what is painting's position in um, convincing a, us of a reality? Mm -hmm. yeah. um, the scale for both of you is very different in this exhibition. Mm -hmm. Can you talk just a little bit about that and some of the um, how you feel that's uh, affected the content of the work or the, the reception of the work potentially? The scale of the work? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, well, I wanted the paper dolls to be life size, which they are in reference to the figures that I painted. So that was my basic strategy. And. Um, I, I'm actually surprised uh, how they function in the space with this small scale because they actually look pretty big. I don't know, that's, that's kind of weird, but um, yeah. What about you? Yeah, um, I don't um, have too much to say about that. It's just that they, it was quite challenging to work on this scale for me because I'm used to working on slightly larger scale, but um, I like the intimacy of the, of the smallest works, actually, and it does change a little bit how they feel, um, particularly this one and the, mm -hmm. the girl in fur. They, they, they're like extra small. <laughs> and uh, I mean, it changes them somewhat, but it doesn't change them entirely. The, there's, it's still the same. Uh, yeah, no, I, I actually think the, the scale of those small works is is really terrific, and it, it is it is very intimate, and in a way, um, it almost draws us in more, mm. because uh, they're not, you know, they they're asking us to get closer, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I've wanted to do, uh, I've thought of doing a, a show of small works for a while, but I haven't. So this was a great opportunity. Mm -hmm. Well, and, and as you said, Sandra, I mean, for me, the, the scale, too, is another direct sort of reference back to the, to the real source material, right? To the, mm -hmm. uh, you know, the real model or the real, you know, sort of page, yeah. right? Um, so it grounds it once again into, into the process and the, the uh, real material. Mm -hmm. Does anybody have comments or questions at, at this point? Got one, maybe. Jim? Uh, we bought a, uh, a painting from Janet 
And uh, you mentioned about uh, looking at images of models or in your inspiration. Um, and you can clearly see that in most of your, your paintings. But, I mean, a model has the, probably the primary feature is the face, right? That's always with lots of makeup and really done up. But the, the one we bought from you, of course, it was, it's a woman in front of a brick wall and the wind's blowing her hair and the hair is obscuring her face. Right. So it's radically different. And then when I see another one, right, the one in the end there. Right. But then since I've been here, I also noticed that most of your pieces, when you can see the face, then you kind of underpaint the background, right? It's very simple. Mm -hmm. But the one we have is a very detailed brick wall. Mm -hmm. And that one there, when you can't see the woman's face, is also fairly much more detailed background. Yes. So is that just happenstance, or this is some avenue that you might be exploring, or you know, the paths you're thinking going down? Um, well, I've done quite a, uh, I've done a number. Of, oh, sorry, a number of works where the face is not visible either because she's turned away, or because there's something covering her face. And um, are you you're wondering if it makes me pay more attention to what's around in the yeah, background? Yeah, yeah, cause, cause the Probably yes. Yes, more a little more detail. More yeah, it, yeah, that brick wall just about killed me. I have to say, <laughs> never again. <laughs> and I sort of feel that way about that landscape too. Uh, but I think um, you know, it's the the uh, the suspense that you have about who is behind the hair or when she turns around, what will she, what will the expression be, what will she look like? Um, it's just a way to um, sustain the the gaze to keep you looking at the painting. To see the face. Okay. Yeah. I think so. So it's about that sort of the not knowing and the waiting and wondering <laughs> what's going to happen. Other, yeah. Uh, I looked at the catalog for a little bit, and there was a you were talking about still life relating to the work, and I'm not. I, I just glanced at it. I'm not sure if you were talking about. I mean. I see, I see it in Sandra's work, but maybe go on further with it in the article. Like, can you talk about a little bit about still life and Jan's work? Right now? There's one Jim's. that maybe you haven't seen yet, yeah. just around the corner, <laughs> which is a, some more of a still life format, a table with okay. objects and an image on it. And I. I think when I was writing about that work in the text, um, I was particularly, and it picks up on your conversation with Jim just now, um, I was particularly interested in the play of words with the image too. Uh, so it's a, it's a still life, um, but the model uh, is represented in such a way, and if you look at her eyes, the image of the woman, if you look at her eyes, they're, they're dead. They look they're bl blackened out. They look very. Um, yes, that's a, that's for me. That's my interpretation. So they're very sort of dark. So there's sort of these ideas for me in many of Janet's works actually about the the way the gaze is obscured, uh, the way that the eyes are averted, darkened, covered, um, and that changes uh, for me as a viewer. That changes my relationship and the sort of power dynamic. Uh, between myself and the, the subject in the painting. Uh, and it also creates a space, I think, again, that kind of opens up that space for projection and desire in a way that, um, you know, it sort of, you really have to think about more critically. So that was my reference to Janet's work in terms of still life. Yes. I just had a uh, question about, um, I, I'm fascinated with, like, person exhibitions or group exhibitions and how it changes an individual artist's work. So for um, maybe each of you in a way to bring these works, these two, like you've met once and then you went away, did the work, and then you brought, brought it together. And has it changed for, for you at all or even Diana for um, how the work operates once they've been kind of brought together like this? And were there any kind of surprises? Or Gosh, um, I love the contrast. At the same time, I love the sympathy. Mm -hmm. It's just so, it seems very bright to me. I, I don't know how else to put it. 
it enlivens my work a lot to see it with Janet's work. I mean, we've known each other for 30 years, and I think that's why we could do this show, is because we instinctively know each other's work very well. So, um, yeah, I think there's informing across the room here from one side to the other, a lot to the benefit of both uh, bodies of work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, I love the contrast and the connection as well. Um, but we did uh, wonder initially whether we would intermix the work or whether we would try to separate them. And um, it quickly became clear that we, we wanted to have them in dialogue but separate because they, w they create, each body of work creates its own sort of web. Um, but having them across from each other is so dynamic. So um, yeah, I'm so happy. We have one wall where they're actually hanging really together. And uh, that's probably my, could be my favorite wall. <laughs> but um, no, I'm very happy to feel the, the heat of Sandra's like sunny frames and then the, the more muted colors. They just, they, I think it wouldn't have worked if we, they'd been all intermixed. You wouldn't get the, the sort of the feeling of each body of work. There's a painting that you made that comes from Idaho. Ohio. Ohio. <laughs> Is that a companion piece to a It Could be. Yeah, I was thinking about that. Yeah. Yeah. Big sky. I knew I was coming to Alberta. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm from the prairies myself. So that big sky is hugely a home, a home place for me. So I wanted to do another one where there was a sky, big sky. I'm always really interested in the relationship of, uh, you know, the female figure and the landscape and, you know, historically in painting with people like Gainsborough, who you're obviously referencing, um, with the DuPont portrait in the back yeah. library. Um, but that relationship between the, the female figure and the landscape and how it's both have been historically um, sites of um, occupation, sites of, of power. Um, so Emma Prairie uh, for me is, a, again, my interpretation of that is really something that is playing with those histories and playing with those relationships between the, the figure ground, but also the history of landscape and portraiture, uh, and how these have functioned historically um, uh, in painting. Thank you so much, all three of you. Thank you. Thank you.